G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Today I am continuing a little series where I go through individual teams who are going to be major players ahead of the 2024 draft. Today we are doing St Kilda, and uh, I suppose they're a major player because they hold multiple selections and might even uh, facilitate a trade with another club as well, which I want to get to later in this video. So I'm going through teams with multiple selections to try and get a feel for what their mindset, what their strategy might be. So I've done Melbourne, I've done Richmond, and I'll continue to work through teams. So the Saints are an intriguing one for a variety of reasons. Okay, they have an interesting draft hand, 7, 8, 32, and 47. That may change. But also, you know, I did a video sometime after the trade period. Actually, I think it was during the trade period where I tried to organize teams into who I thought was in the premiership window, approaching the premiership window or, you know, rebuilding. I categorized all 18 teams and St. Kilda and Melbourne were two teams where I probably just wasn't quite sure what their next step was. You know, are they are they moving up the ladder to try and compete soon? Are they still replenishing through talent? So in this video, I'm going to go through exactly what I think their list build looks like and that will ultimately help inform what I think they'll do with their selections, which is really the whole reason I started doing these videos was to try and get an insight as to how they might select in this year's draft. So like I did with the Melbourne and Richmond videos, we're going to start this by just getting up there a best 23. And this is provided by Fox Footy, if you couldn't tell by the little logo down there. So I just thought it would be worth having a look at this best 23 and see if we learn anything that might help inform our draft decisions. And also I've had a look at their immediate depth as well. So in terms of what's different about that 23, there's not a whole lot in comparison to say a Richmond who, you know, sold off a lot of players for draft picks this year. St Kilda have lost Josh Battle and that is not an insignificant loss. He's a good player. It did help them secure pick eight in the draft and they'll be very pleased about that, I think, on balance. Jack McRae is the main addition to this team, as you can see. I suppose when you see the team mapped out like that, it, it kind of makes sense why they went for a Jack McRae. It's kind of a new look midfield they're going for. It seems like gone are the days of Seb Ross, who's been delisted, Brad Crouch and Zach Jones occupying time at the center bounce. This is a new, fresh midfield that St Kilda have coming up underneath. And I suppose Jack McRae is seen as an upgrade on some of those experienced big bodied mids. And when you look at that team, that is probably something they need. Okay, you've got Jack Steele, pretty proven on baller, even if, you know, he was probably better a few years ago than he is right now. Still a good player. And he's supported by Jack McRae there because after that, you've got Mateus Filippou, who I think is a great young talent and back end of the year really well with some strong form after coming back into the team. But but what McRae clearly provides there is experience support and it, it kind of makes perfect sense now why St Kilda added a Jack McRae to their list. Now you look at the midfield rotations around that, I suppose you've got some big bodied bit part midfielders like Hunter Clark, I think spent about 47% of time at the center bounce last year. He's named in the back pocket, so a bit of a rotation there. Paddy Dow, I think, spent a bit of time in the midfield, particularly at the back end of the year. Wynn Tager, as well, is named on the bench. You'd imagine he's a midfield rotation, even if he's a little bit more defensively oriented. You probably also add in at least one draftee. I'm reliably informed that the Saints need to add to their midfield, and that is something that I do agree with. To what extent they invest in the midfield this draft, we'll go through that too. But I think their first selection probably is going to be lined up for the best available midfielder, as we'll get to. I want to talk about their list changes. It was quite an aggressive offseason in terms of these list cuts. So a fair chunk of experience has been shared in a couple of harsh calls. Maybe not harsh, I don't really know, to be honest, but somewhat harsh calls to delist some of their 2022 draftees at the end of their first contract. It's not entirely rare, but it is quite early. But we'll go through it. Josh Battle, Seb Ross, Tim Membry, Riley Bonner, Jack Hayes, Tom Campbell, Ben Payton, Ollie Hotton, James Van Ness, and Matthew Allison. Now, I don't know anything about the last couple. I do remember Hotton as a prospect. His younger brother, Taj, is going to be in the draft this year. But other than that, there's a fair bit of experience, like Seb Ross, Tim Membry, Jack Hayes in particular, like late 20s, early 30s. Tom Campbell, same thing. He's just gone to Melbourne. To what extent are these guys important to their team? Uh, well, Seb Ross comes out and Jack McRae goes in, so I think that's fine. Membry surprised me a little bit that he moved on and he's joined the Pies, or at least is going to. By the time this video comes out, that might be formal. Riley Bono, another established player there. So this shedding of experience is a fairly aggressive list call. And other than Josh Battle there, I'm sure these guys weren't critical. So this to me speaks to the idea that they're kind of rounding out their list and, and really focusing on a group of young players that are probably going to be there in three years from now. A 
I've had a little bit of a once over of their depth. And then the first thing I looked at is uh, what kind of depth they have in terms of key position players, forwards, backs, and rucks. Because when you're doing things like phantom drafts, you want to have a good handle on which teams are likely to be picking tall in this year's draft and who will not. And from what I can tell, you know, outside that selected best 23, there's Zane Cordy as a key position defender. There's Ari Shonmaker, who possibly forms as a Josh Battle replacement, as a slightly undersized, not quite a true key position player, more of a rebounding tall defender. So on the surface, I'd say a key position defender could be absolutely on the menu for the Saints this year. How early they go, we'll get into that. Key forwards, you got Caminiti, who wasn't named in this team. He kicked 15 goals from 15 games this year and he's played 20 games pretty early, but I think that's pretty solid output for a key position player at that age, 196 centimeters. There's Isaac Hilo, who's a ruck forward who hasn't played a game. I remember him being quite a high upside player. Um, there's Max Heath is a zero game a ruckman as well who hasn't naturally played a game. So my point being there, across the board, I wouldn't necessarily suggest that St Kilda are not going to be looking for talls at all. Now, it's just a case of how many picks are they taking and which picks do they allocate for talls. How many picks they take will be interesting too. I haven't actually done the math on it, but looking at how many players they delisted, they're probably going to certainly use all of their four picks that are currently listed in 7, 8, 32, and 47, and we'll explore the possibility of a pick split as well. So if they're taking five picks, which I think, you know, is probably probably on the cards here, strong draft, deep draft. I'd imagine at least one, maybe two of those players are talls. Again, we'll just go through how early they pick talls. So we need to consider broadly, what else do they need, right? What are their general draft needs? We obviously just highlighted the need for talls. You look over the last three years, I was actually in preparation for this video, watching a video on Saints TV, which is run by Jake. So if there's any Saints fans watching this who haven't heard of Saints TV, I'd be surprised, but if there are some that exist, definitely recommend it. Jake does a great job. But I was watching a video around their recent drafting. And Jake mentions that uh, some time ago, St. Kilda said that they wanted to hit four drafts in a row. And I think St. Kilda, their recent drafting of late has actually really turned a corner, which is the main point of Jake's video. And it does confirm some things that I had already previously been saying as well. In that, I really rate this young group of talent. But specifically as well, there has been a clear style bias as well in terms of recruiting players who were dynamic, fast on the outside, and skillful. You could look at guys like Darcy Wilson in the most recent draft. Lance Collard as well as a small forward who, you know, could put, push up into a wing. They traded in Liam Henry. Philippou as well as a very dynamic player. And Isaiah Wanganin Miller as a rebounding defender. There's a huge concentration of more slick, outside, and fast players, as opposed to picking some more grunt players. So that, that kind of leads me to think, maybe, maybe they do need a little bit of grunt. Maybe grunt is on the menu for St. Kilda. I'll have the grunt well done, please. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's going to make the edit. Um, but yeah, just to highlight some really good draft picks. Uh, Mateus Philippou at pick 10, I think is looking like a great selection. Wanganin Miller at pick 11. Darcy Wilson at 18. And then further to that, you've got a couple of academy boys um, that, you know, I don't know how much credit you give St. Kilda's drafting team, but if you're looking at it as a period between 2021 and 2023 and potentially 2024, St. Kilda's drafting really has gone up a notch. So those academy players being Machido Owens and Marcus Windhager. Pick 33 and 47, great value. So let's circle back to what they need in this year's draft. Um, and I think a midfield focus is certainly on the agenda, but maybe a movement away from the classy outside types and it's time to, to get a couple of grunt midfielders. And that makes me think of guys like Harvey Langford and Josh Smiley, partly because those guys are likely to be available at their first selection. You know, it's all well and good to say that, that they could use a Jagger Smith or, or Sam Lawler. Um, I just don't think either of those are gonna be available. So keeping it real, Langford and Smiley, both of them, presents as those inside midfield options that really add something to St Kilda. Neither of them are particularly quick, but they're both good footballers. And Smiley in particular, whilst I think that Langford might be the superior product, Smiley would add stylistically something that St Kilda could really use. So the question is with pick seven and eight, which probably becomes eight and nine or nine and 10, depending on where bids go. Well, the question is, do they take two midfielders, two big bodied midfielders with both of those selections? It's an interesting question. You consider that, you know, maybe in three years, you know, post Jack McRae, their midfield might be Jack Steele is the veteran, Josh Smiley, Philippou, Langford, Windhager, guys like Hugo Garcia, who I, I don't have much of an opinion on, but I've read good things about. And perhaps as well, Machido Owens as that dynamic hybrid player who can rotate through there. I don't know what the future of Machido Owens as a footballer is. I know he's a gun talent. Is he a primary on baller? Is he going to be an impact forward who rotates through the guts? I'm not sure, but point being, you know, maybe that can work. Maybe they can get Smiley and at Langford. This is assuming one of them hasn't been picked by Melbourne. We're speaking in hypotheticals here. The other alternative is 
in my opinion, is to still, you know, prioritize the gun inside of midfielder, whoever they deem it to be, one of Langford and Smiley, and with the second selection, perhaps look to diversify that with a different style prospect. So then you throw into the mix, Bo Allen, Toby Trevalia. These guys are different, but both of them come with the caveat we don't know for sure that they're midfielders of the next level, which is something I feel like I've been saying a lot on this channel, but I've just done videos on each of those players. But Bo Allen is a gun athlete, and when he's a defender, he's an athletic, explosive, quick, rebounding defender, good, strong aerial game, good leap on him. Trevalier is probably similar in that respect, and both have some scope to be in the midfield. I think Bo Allen probably has a little bit more proven ability in that space, being you know primarily a midfielder for WA in the champs. And he is a very contested style midfielder. So it's kind of the best of both worlds there for St Kilda. If they did go for someone like a Bo Allen, he could become that inside grunt style midfielder. Or at the very least, he becomes a gun defender. But I suppose you could say that about Trevalier. So yeah, bottom line is, do they go for the two primary midfielders? Do they take a risk on another one who may not become a midfielder, but probably will also be a very good defender? Then there's the question of, do they go tall? And I was watching on the AFL YouTube channel today, Toomey on Gettable, I presume it was, was saying that the Saints are one team looking at Harry Armstrong. Now, looking at their list depth, I, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't go for a Harry Armstrong if they rate him. I suppose the caveat to that is there is a number of good tools in this year's draft that they could potentially get later. So it's a talent assessment thing. And, and St Kilda's drafting of late has been pretty solid. So I'll defer to their judgment. But is Harry Armstrong that much better that they would take him at pick eight in addition to, say, a Harvey Langford? Or do they explore a trade and look to stock up some tools that could be available in the late teens, early 20s as it currently stands? There's a bit of a glut in, in terms of rankings of key positional forwards. So they need to assess, is Harry Armstrong that much better than, say, a Jonty Fall, a Job Shanahan, a Jack Whitlock? They don't hold a pick in the late teens or the early 20s, but I suppose that's where you explore a trade. So if they do want to go tall, do they trade that pick? So the trade that um, I heard uh, Jake from Saints TV actually exploring this was eight for 15 and 16 from GWS. I had heard talk GWS are trying to package picks and move up. I did also read that and I don't know if this is true, but West Coast apparently offered three for 15 and 16 and GWS rejected that. That cannot be true. I'm just saying I read that, but I think I read that from an unreliable source. But I think eight for 15 and 16 could be mutually beneficial. So let's just run with that for a minute. You hold that pick seven or whatever it's going to be on the night for that best available midfielder. And then suddenly you re-enter re the draft at 15 and 16. If they are keen on adding a good quality tall forward, this trade does make sense. In an even talent pool, yes, there's that. And they would give up you know, a second gun midfielder there. They'd probably lose access, almost certainly, to someone like a Bo Allen or a Toby Trevalier if, if they rate those kids. If they are dead set on Harry Armstrong, they need to hold that pick. But if they are not, then maybe you go Langford at pick seven. And then holding two picks in a row, you still could have access to someone like a Taj Houghton if they want to draft the brother of the kid they just delisted. Do they go for a Murphy Reed? Would they look to get a genuine inside midfielder like a Tom Gross? There's options there. There's still some good quality small players. And then with the second pick, that's where guys like Jonty Fall, Job Shanahan in particular come into the mix. Luke Trainer is an interesting variable in this, and I will keep throwing him up for where I think it is suitable because I think for a need, St Kilda could be one of those teams to take the punt on him. Now they hold two selections, and I probably think as it currently stands, you probably wouldn't imagine Luke Trainer is pick seven or eight. And there is a lot of unknown and a lot of innuendo about Luke Trainer's concussion injuries. And I see in pockets, people are saying, nah, he's a do not touch, but I, I just don't know how much of that is grounded in reality. So I'll speak broadly and say that if Luke Trainer is okay from a concussion standpoint, 15 or 16 would be a great pick to take him at. I realize that is a big if, but I do think, you know, another third tall defender described as another Ridley-esque player who can hurt you from the back half. I think St Kilda is one of the teams and not all teams will have a need for trainer, but I think for St Kilda, it could make sense at 15 or 16. It'll be interesting as well if St Kilda hold any interest in Alex Toru. Now he is one that is hard to project exactly where he's gonna go. I'm actually gonna record a video on him later today, but it could be as early as North Melbourne at pick two, which, you know, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but that's probably the earliest that's possible. And then you go down to, I don't know, 12 at West Coast. That's probably about as far as I can imagine him going. So are St Kilda at one of those teams that would look at an Alex Torre? And if that is the case, well, there is the possibility he's not available at all. But if he is, that is one that they will need to take with pick eight. Perhaps, you know, in this hypothetical trade with GWS that I'm exploring here, it could be in the Saints' best interest and, and GWS's to wait until the night and, and see who's available in real time. Because if Toru is available at pick seven and eight unexpectedly, then maybe the Saints, if they are keen, grab him there. Conversely, if he's gone, 
Um, St Kilda might be keen to just take, say, one of Harvey Langford and Josh Smiley and trade back to get more selections. Then I do think from a value point of view, that is a good move for St Kilda. They're probably going to have room for well and truly five picks. So if that becomes 7, 15, 16, 32 and 47, they still have their access to their top line midfielder. They get an extra selection in a talent pool that is considered relatively even. And they might get one or potentially two good key position players before other teams start coming in in the range that they're expected to go. St Kilda is probably also one of those teams that could consider Alex Dodson the number one ruck in this year's draft because I think looking at their ruck stocks, you've got Rowan Marshall, they've just lost Tom Campbell, they're reportedly interested in, in recruiting another ruckman this year. They could probably use a decent ruck prospect on their list. For me, I don't think I would do it at 7, 15 or 16. Um, if he's hypothetically available at what is currently 32 then I think St Kilda could absolutely roll the dice on him because I think there is a positional need there however there may be better prospects available in their in their estimation and perhaps recruiting you know a ready-made one from a state league is also something they would look at so yeah in summary uh, I, I'm keen to hear what you guys have to say particularly Saints fans around the way that St Kilda use these picks I'm not entirely convinced that they take both midfielders in say a Langford if he's available and a Smiley if they're both there is that overkill do you agree with that. I'm sure it can work if they take both, but I think a better use of assets could be one of Langford and Smiley, trade down to 15 and 16, pick up at least one quality tall, potentially two, but maybe just one. Consider guys like Murphy Reed, Ollie Hotton, Hannaford as well, you know, these sorts of talented types that are starting to bolt up. I don't know if they'd be suited to someone like a Xavier Lindsay, who on talent would be a great selection if they do hold 15. I just suspect he's probably a little bit too similar to some of the other types that they've recruited in recent times. But anyway, guys, that is my say on St Kilda. They're going to be an interesting watch. I do think they're building a really good group of young talent that could be a serious team in a number of years. A lot of high upside types, a lot of damaging players as well. I do think even though they've shed a lot of experience, there's enough to support this young group getting through. And I think I've learned that this really is about their under 24 group in terms of that being the group that's going to take them potentially to the promised land. Now, a, a talent assessment on the list is one thing. They've got to actually go do it now. But I've been bullish on them for a while and uh, I'm intrigued to see what they do in this year's draft. So let me know in the comments what you think, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.